Hi, everybody. This is the first of several short videos that will cover the material that we're covering in class in phylogenetics. So today we'll, or in this video, in this short video, uh, we'll cover the background material in the lecture notes. Okay, so here's the background. I want to start here with this notebook entry. This is an entry from Darwin's own notebooks, 22 years before publication of The Origin of Species. And this is a, a, a note that he scribbled into, the, um, into his, his notebooks. And he said, he wrote, I think. And then he, he drew this tree-like structure. And this is the first known example of Darwin or anyone else trying to draw a tree to represent the process that became known as natural selection. That's 22 years before the publication of The Origin of Species. Later, when he wrote The Origin of Species, and by the time it was in its sixth edition in 1872, he wrote this. Um, and I think this is quite uh, beautifully written, and this is the, just in the sixth edition. The affinities of all the beings of the same class have sometimes been represented by a great tree. I believe this simile largely speaks the truth. The green and budding twigs may represent existing species, and those produced during each former year may represent the long succession of extinct species. There's so much packed into this that is still the case in the way we understand the trees that we end up drawing in phylogenetics. One thing is that the tree structure, which is a mathematical structure, is correct when we uh, believe that it, it represents the truth. That, that, so here this, I believe this simile largely speaks the truth is important because mathematical structures of trees are used in many types of representation, many types of data analysis. The difference is, is that in evolution, in an evolutionary tree, the tree is meant to represent something of evolutionary history, of actual evolutionary history as its model. And so it's different from other cases of, say, exploratory data analysis, where we might use trees as tools of convenience. The other thing is that he notes that in this description, the twigs, the, the, the leaves, as we call them now, may represent existing species, and those produced by each former year may represent the long succession of extinct species. That is also how we represent phylogenetic trees today. The leaves of the trees represent typically our observations of species or sequences or genes, and the branching patterns that we draw within the tree represent history, represent some earlier evolutionary history. Of course, the idea of a tree of life is not Darwin's. Uh, it's covered in multitudes of religions and different uh, origin stories, so it's, it's quite ancient. Um, but what is Darwin's and Wallace's was the identification of evolution by means of natural selection. And so this is different because this provided a scientific basis for, to understand how life evolved. It provided a scientific basis that could be tested and explored and experimented with and used to derive models. And sometimes this is referred to as, Darwin referred to it as descent with modification. Now, importantly, there's a, there's a bit here that we're not gonna go into, but if you're interested in the history of the science of evolution, there is an important uh, period because Darwin published his book in, in 1859 and uh, Darwinism and evolution as understood through natural selection was dominant in the latter half of the 19th century. But then with the discovery of genetics, uh, discovery of Mendel's work and the genetics of the early 20th century, it was thought um, and believed by many people that genetics and, uh, and Darwinian evolution were mutually incompatible. Uh, this was not true, but it wasn't known not to be true until the 1930s with the development of the modern synthesis, which used some uh, emerging mathematical and statistical ideas to show that natural selection was not only compatible with genetics, but was uh, entirely consistent with genetics. And this is referred to as the modern synthesis. Sometimes this is referred to in uh, various forms as neo-Darwinism, which is the, the, uh, the merger or the synthesis of genetics and evolution that began in earnest in the 1930s. Okay, that's a little history. Importantly, 
all of the phylogenies that were determined up until the 1960s were determined using morphological characteristics or other types of characteristics, not molecular characteristics. So molecular information to determine phylogenies is relatively recent. It's only in the 1960s that that began to be used. And of course, much more so as DNA sequencing became available and widespread. More generally, phylogenetic trees are built from observable characters of the, the products of evolution. So here we see a kind of a crude representation of a tree, which is showing anatomical features of various types of animals. And what I want to show on this, what I want to emphasize on this, is that there are points on the tree that represent demarcations of those characters. So only to the right of this demarcation do animals have fur and mammary glands. Only up and to the left of this do animals have feathers. Only to the right of this do animals have claws or nails, and so on, lungs, jaws. So these characters, these are characters that allow us or allow uh, cladists or evolutionary biologists to describe the tree in terms of the way those characters are segregated on one side of the tree or another. And that's a, an important basis for understanding how phylogenetic trees are drawn. Now, when we say a character, of course, it could be an alphabetic character. In fact, it, it might very well be a letter in, when we're working with DNA and protein sequences. But in this case, we're thinking of a heritable change in the features, in a feature of an organism. Uh, so it might be morphological, it can be DNA sequence, and so on. So lots of different forms of characters, so long as they are heritable changes that we can observe and document. In general, okay, this is a gloss, but the general uh, idea is that the more similarity there is in terms of characters between two organisms or sequences, the closer the relationship is in inference between those two organisms or those two sequences. That's the general principle on which phylogenetic trees are constructed. But when we look at characters, we have to make a distinction when we're drawing a tree as to whether those characters are unique or non-unique. Uh, this is an important distinction. Um, it comes up with morphological characteristics, but it's true in general. There's a, a fundamental distinction between unique and non-unique characters. So what's a unique character? A unique character is something that has evolved only once. And because it's evolved only once, or once within the tree, that within the tree we're considering, then it is a good marker of evolutionary history. So in that sense, the characters on that earlier tree a couple of slides ago are unique characters, and hair is one such character. If an organism has hair and mammary glands, it's likely to be a mammal. Now, non-unique characters are those characters that might have evolved more than once. And so if they've evolved more than once and that has been independent, then they would be examples of convergent evolution. And because of that, identification of that trait, identification of that character does not allow the inference of phylogeny. There are lots of such characters. So wings or flight is such a character. Eyesight is such a character. There are many different types of eyesight. Eyesight sight has evolved uh, multiple times in, in evolution. Um, and not so surprisingly, right? These are, uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, useful to be able to fly or to be able to see, and, or the utility of tails is also very useful. So these things have evolved multiple times in evolutionary history. When we see uh, convergent evolution and the similarity from convergent evolution, this is referred to as homoplasy. You may remember that when we were talking about it in terms of structural similarity of proteins, it's referred to as analogy, but here it's referred to as homoplasy. I want to end this background piece with a, a couple of examples of a particularly important tree that represented a landmark in molecular evolution. Because this tree, or something like this, this is uh, built by Carl Rose, um, and it was built in 1977 following this other publication. This tree is built entirely on ribosomal RNA. So it's not using any morphological characteristics. Uh, and because all organisms have ribosomal RNA, you can look across maybe the entire tree of life this way. 
And this is a really important tree in the history of molecular evolution. Uh, it's also an important tree because it represents uh, something uh, like the tree of life. And uh, this was an important tree. It was a very controversial tree when it was first proposed. Uh, and the reason that it was controversial is because, well, among other things, it has three major domains of life, which was not known before. So notice here the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. That was not known before. So uh, prior to the work on that tree, prior to Woese's work, uh, it was thought that there were basically eukaryotes and prokaryotes, the bacteria, and Woese identified these three domains of life based on these molecular evolutionary trees, two domains of prokaryotes, the bacteria and the archaea. And um, in this tree, if you notice, the archaea are over here near the eukaryote. So this divergence here from uh, a universal common ancestor goes towards bacteria and then goes towards archaea and eukaryotes. Uh, and that as well is, was controversial. Uh, so Woese's tree is based on this phylogenetic analysis of 16S ribosomal RNA. And that was a landmark and it's uh, its descendants, I guess, uh, have now been used to derive trees of all of life for uh, in, in many, uh, many circumstances. And so we can ask, what does the tree look like today? So I, I don't have a tree today, but I do have a tree 15 years ago, uh, which uh, is a good example of, of how Woese's tree had developed, it, at least in, in the time between 1977 and 2006. So Trees like this are now built based on not just 16 sRNA, but certain types of comparisons of whole genomes. Um, and so the methodology has developed, as we'll see, but uh, the basic discoveries that Woes made are still uh, true today. So if we look at that 2006 tree, we can see that there are lots and lots and lots of bacteria. So that's this purple color, and then this, um, I guess, whatever pinkish color here are the eukaryotes, and then the green color here are the archaea. So like Woese's tree, there are three domains of life. Like Woese's tree, the presumed branch point from the last universal common ancestor, which is posited to be here, we'll get, a, we'll get to how that kind of uh, inference is made, uh, goes to bacteria and then goes to the common ancestor of eukaryotes and archaea. And then that split between eukaryotes and archaea is somewhat later on, the, on this particular tree. Uh, at any rate, the, the key finding of the discovery of archaea, the identification of three domains of life and the power of using sequence information in Woese's case, 16S RNA has held true since 1977 and it, it's still um, a landmark in molecular evolution. So that's the end of this video. I'll see you in the next video as we move forward in our discussion of phylogenetics.